All right, we are now live for another AMA that is Ask Me Anything session here on YouTube for uh, my channel. And let me just make sure everything is set up the way we want it. Uh, I see there's quite a few questions already lined up, which is uh, cool. Um, glad to see those. Glad to have everybody here popping in. Um, unfortunately, in the interface, I can't actually see how many people are in the, the interface, but, um, you know, I'm guessing probably our normal number, maybe through the sound input volume down a little bit, it can get a little bit loud with this mic set the way it is. All right, so let's see what we have here. Um, first question is from Mario Wobnig. Have I read the novel Steppenwolf by Herman Hesse? And if I did, have I related to Harry Holler's struggles? No, I haven't read Steppenwolf. Uh, the, the stuff that I read by Hesse, there was uh, Siddhartha and uh, a few other things, but that I haven't read Steppenwolf. So it's one of those things that eventually I might get to <laughs> if I get the chance. Uh, it kind of depends on how, how busy I am. Um, but, okay, so Mario is bringing up this thing between Nietzsche's Apollonian and Dionysian. I will say this, Hesse, like many other people, I think misunderstood Nietzsche. It's very common for artists to take off from Nietzsche's birth of tragedy and be like, everything's Apollonian or Dionysian. And they totally misunderstand the, the fact that the book is, you know, two thirds about a whole different thing. The third noble response to the problem of life, which is the Socratic and then Alexandrian, which is uh, neither Apollonian nor Dionysian and actually blocks both of them effectively. It misunderstands both. Um, so I don't know. I, I haven't read that that particular piece, but I've, I've seen a lot of uh, artists and novelists manage to misunderstand Nietzsche on that, on that particular point. Um, Adam, how would you describe philosophical thinking in contrast with mathematical thinking? The common feature of both is working with abstractions. So it depends on whose philosophical thinking we're talking about, doesn't it? Because it's not as if there's just one single thing that we call philosophical thinking. I know there's there's a lot of intro to philosophy textbooks and there's a lot of like what is philosophy books, you know, some of them written by quite good philosophers who will try to <clears throat> say, you know, well here's philosophical thinking, here's here's mathematical thinking. But I got to say after years and years of reading that sort of stuff, I've never found one where I'm totally satisfied with a you might say monistic uh, conception of what philosophy is because um, philosophy has been and meant many things over the years. And unless the, um, you know, the model for philosophy is able to take in a whole bunch of great philosophers as paradigms, um, I don't think it's an adequate model. Um, you could say that mathematical thinking, and even that is kind of, kind of broad too, right? Um, Mathematical thinking is at least concerned with a certain range of, of uh, objects or, or ideas. I mean, Plato was the one who sort of kicks that, that off. I know you could say Pythagoras, but we don't really have that much by Pythagoras or the Pythagoreans until much later on. Um, but Plato definitely thinks that mathematical objects, numbers or, or quantities, and then geometric um, things are... They have their own peculiar mode of existence, you know, that we have to reach through through abstraction. Um, and, and there's, you know, sort of a, at least a distinction between the two going forward from there. But I don't think I, I would uh, try to even describe them in contrast with each other because they're, you know, like I said, philosophy is pluralistic. Um, James Calder, do you think dumb people can be smart? Um, sure, in the sense of they can become smart, but oftentimes what that's going to require is figuring out why they're dumb and then trying to overcome some of those, uh, you might say, sources or, or um, obstacles or impediments that, that, that produce the dumbness, right? So, you know, that's not easy to do because... If you were, you know, really that smart, you could say to the, the person who's struggling with that, well, you'd, you'd already be halfway along the way. Um, I will say that a lot of people, you know, the, the, the real obstacle 
this is a little bit of a different answer to, to studying philosophy in many cases is not sheer intellectual ability. It's, it's more like, um, you know, certain misunderstandings that people have, have gotten along the way and, and they've become emotionally attached to like, you know, they read a, they, they encountered somebody who taught philosophy or wrote about philosophy and they got this idea that philosophy has to be what this person says. You know, you see a lot of people who, um, you know, are, are attracted to Thomism, for example, taking out that that sort of view, or people who are trained in analytic philosophy. You know, and analytic philosophy is an incredibly wide field as well. So there's like di <coughs> different ways of doing it that are sometimes not viewed as compatible with each other. Um, so there's, there's those sorts of things. Expecting philosophy to be just like other disciplines that one studies, another sort of problem I think that comes up. Um, being unwilling to entertain ideas that one doesn't agree with without immediately trying to look for the, the you know, uh, weak points or something like that. That keeps people from learning. Um, it's, it's difficult to study philosophy and make much progress unless you are at least willing to see where Descartes is going or where this, you know, latest theorist is, is going with their ideas before you jump on and say, ah, I know exactly what that is, right, and, and then condemn it. All right, uh, Shaf Ali Khan, can you explain the reasoning behind George Berkeley's to be is to be perceived in his ontological argument for God? I don't know that um, that uh, Berkeley has an ontological argument for God. Um, as a matter of fact, he considers God just as he considers us to be spirits. Um, they're what lie behind the the perceptible phenomenon. And, and that to be is to be perceived it has to be understood in two different ways, right? There's there's the things that we actually do perceive, which are ideas, not material realities, according to Barclay. Um, but then there's the things lying behind those ideas, w which we don't di directly perceive, like you know spirits, and we think that those are responsible for for those ideas. Um, and he thinks that God is is one of them. Um, you know, one way of thinking about Barclay and metaphysics and epistemology is he really is committed to this notion that to be is to be perceived. And that means that when we stop perceiving something, it would, it would stop to, you know, to exist, right? It would no longer be, except for the fact that you have God. And God provides a certain kind of consistency and constancy to our, our array of perceptions. Um, so without, if you take God out of the picture, it would be a chaos, wouldn't it? And you'd never really be able to be sure of anything that you're, you're seeing. Um, Shaf also asks, and shed some light on Kantian morals. Well, um, I don't know what you want. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of complicated. I've got like, uh, what, 20 odd videos just on Kant's groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, because it's not something easily summed up. I mean, you can say, well, you know, categorical imperative in its three formulations is at the key or at the, at the core of it. And that's, that's true. But I mean, that's only in the groundwork too. Then we have, you know, the second critique and uh, religion within the limits of reason alone, which is really a book of ethics and the actual groundwork for the, or the actual metaphysics of morals, which is two parts of the doctrine of virtue and the doctrine of justice. Um, and all these other writings. So, I mean, what you can say is that Kant really is concerned with the notion of duty, and he thinks that, that you know, um, we can conceptualize that through laws that we recognize and then impose upon ourselves and either follow or don't follow, and that our autonomy consists in large part in extricating ourselves from, you might call it the stimulus response auto automaticity of, of psychological laws, um, you know, or ways of determination. Um, I think that's probably a, a good enough sum up for, for here. Um, you know, it's, this isn't like a session where we just go deep into any particular thinker. All right, Chip, uh, any favorite or most recommended works by John Cassian? Well, there's not much by the guy, you know, we have the const we have the uh, conferences and then we have the institutes. And then there's this treatise on the incarnation of, of the Lord, which nobody ever reads, um, but it's kind of interesting. 
um, but had almost no influence on, on the history of philosophy. Um, the institutes and the conferences, that's really interesting stuff. The conferences are these recordings of conversations that Cassian and his uh, fellow uh, traveling monk had with all of these abbots over the course of years in the Egyptian desert. And they're, they're you know, thinking out issues, oftentimes in terms of a sort of Neoplatonist anthropology, but applied to, um, you know, the spiritual life uh, in, in, in a Christian context. Um, these are people who were experimentally involved, right, trying to figure out how to make things work. And then you have the, uh, the institutes, which is sort of a blueprint for what a monastic community would look like and a, a major discussion of the eight capital vices, which later on become, as I think everybody knows, the seven deadly sins, right? Um, so those are the works to read by Cassian. You, you notice that um, St. Benedict in, in Benedict's Rule, very important in Western monasticism, uh, recommends Cassian as one of the, the, re the authors who ought to be read by, by monks um, so that they can understand the, the spiritual life and the demands of monasticism. Uh, James Calder, what do I think of Chomsky? Uh, I think he's um, interesting, but I don't buy into uh, his linguistic stuff very much, you know. And uh, I'll say this, he's, he's consistent, and I admire consistency, um, so that's good. Uh, Gabriel, um, have I thought of making a video series on the history and many iterations of the ontological argument? Yeah, I mean, I've thought of writing uh, stuff on that as well. Um, one of my very early conference papers was was precisely about that at the second, no, the first St. Anselm conference at St. Anselm College, sponsored by the Institute for St. Anselm Studies, right? Um, and, you know, I may, I may do some work on that uh, eventually. Um, I, you know, it'd be kind of fun to do some, some like, ideas in, in, in history and trace out what, what's done with them and where they go and who, who says what and why they say it. But that'd be a, a matter of finding the time. Um, all right, AP, what's my opinion on the speculative realist movement? Um, not sure what that is. Uh, I think I may be con mixing that up with another speculative something or other. Uh, if we're talking about like the Graham Harmon type of people, it's interesting. I, I don't see it as making any really major new contribution. It was it was sort of like the, you know, 15 years ago. What do you think about radical orthodoxy? Well, it's interesting stuff they're doing, but I don't see a lot of legs on, on this. Um, I could be wrong, but I, I'd, you know, be more willing to spend my time reading more classical texts than, than that. All right, uh, Nicholas Hamilton, what was my high school and college? I went to Catholic Memorial not far from here, down the road in uh, Waukesha. Went to Lakeland College. This is all stuff you can find easily on my, my website and my bio. Um, and then I went to Southern Illinois for graduate study down in Carbondale. Um, let's see here. So Olson asks, a kind of vague question. Do you, any amount of philosophy can actually fix all of this? Um, so I, I imagine that's about can philosophy fix the screwed up world that we find ourselves in, right? And the answer is, yeah, to some degree. But, I mean, don't expect it to be a magic bullet that, you know, kill, kills every evil and takes care of everything. you got to um, philosophy takes a while to study. Not all of it is directly applicable to, to working on uh, complicated problems. Some of it's kind of, you know, little cul-de-sacs over here and there. And it takes a while to, um, you know, to get it to, uh, to work, um, both in applying it and getting other people to buy into it and even in getting oneself uh, sort of wrapped around it. You know, it often involves changing one's habits and developing resources that one didn't originally have. But yeah, I mean, philosophy has, has uh, plenty of, of uh, you know, potential for making things better. 
um, usually not all by itself, usually in conjunction with other things. So, for example, if you're doing philosophical counseling uh, like I do, you probably want to know a good bit about psychology as well, right? Um, and, you know, if you're going to talk to business people, you got to actually know something about the business world and how it works, and you got to be able to communicate across disciplines. So um, Adam asks, what is the Hegelian idea? Um, there is no one Hegelian idea. There's a number of different ideas uh, if we're talking about like key concepts of Hegel. If you mean like what, is, what does Hegel mean by the idea, it depends on what stage of what you're, you're looking at, right? Um, I will say this, that for Hegel, it's incredibly important that, that ideas are not understood as purely speculative, but as inherently practical so that they, they attain their, their reality, their Wirklichkeit in German, their actuality in being institutionalized and being lived out. And that's often how we, we tell what's in an idea as opposed to what it's just presented as at, at the start. So that's important. Adam asks, where do I stand in the fact-value dichotomy debate? I don't know that there's a debate about that. If there is, I, I missed it. Um, there's, there's a lot of discussions about, you know, is there a di fundamental difference between facts and values? Every attempt to try to classify those rigidly apart from each other fails. I mean, because these are sort of ground concepts. Um, you need both of them involved to make any sense out of things. I mean, you know, you can even talk as Nietzsche does about like the will to truth, right? And, you know, this desire for facts that would be something different from, from values. Um, it's driven by values. I mean, and again, this is sort of a, uh, not just a Nietzsche point, there's also a Hegel point, right? Hegel recognized that very clearly. Um, oftentimes it gets, it gets uh, conflated with the is-ought distinction, and that often gets, um, you know, drawn out of, out, out of Hume, um, although there's other authors who make similar uh, distinctions. Um, but I read Hume not as saying, oh, there's this fundamental difference between is and ought, and you can't get an, an ought from an is. Well, you never get an ought from an is because there's always all these background oughts uh, in play. And uh, it's just a question of bringing them to light and taking a look at them and seeing if, if uh, they're valid or not or what context they're valid in. I think a lot of people like to, they like these nice, simple, you know, dichotomies that then they can try to, you know, classify everything into and then the work of philosophy is over. But, you know, dichotomies are only as good as their, their uh, applicability. And they need to be consistent as well. They need to be self-consistent. So, um, yeah. All right, Zaina, um, what's my view on Kant's refusal to Anselm's ontological argument for God's existence? So Kant, I, I should point this out, not only does he, he reject the ontological argument saying that existence is not a predicate, um, he also views Anselm's argument, or not Anselm's argument, ontological arguments, right? Because actually he's not actually representing Anselm. The only time that I know that he actually takes on Anselm as such is his lectures on, what, philosophy of religion or something like that. No, that's, that's, that, that's, that's not the right title, but there's, there's a work of lectures where he actually does look carefully at, at something like Anselm's argument. Um, what you have in the first critique is not Anselm's argument. Um, but that, that's because most people think that, you know, Anselm's argument is what, what people make of it later. Anselm's argument is what's in the Proslogion. There's other ontological arguments like that of Descartes, for example, um, or Spinoza or, or other people. And so Kant thinks not only that the ontological argument is is no good, but that cosmological and teleological arguments in some secret way depend on the ontological argument. Um, I, think both, I think both of those are mistaken on Kant's part, but I think that's because Kant, you know, he's got his particular way of approaching things. So there's literally no room within his system for something like an ontological argument that would, would be any good. Um, and I think he's wrong with, with construing the other arguments as in some way dependent on it, but it's understandable once you look at Kant's project. Um, so, you know, 
But I, you know, when it comes to the ontological argument, I go back and forth and back and forth about how how good of an argument it is, which makes perfect sense because Anselm himself did, right? Um, as did other interpreters of ontological arguments. Uh, Arjanus, what's the earliest definition of the subject in philosophy? So that's kind of a trick question. Um, I would say it's in Aristotle, but it doesn't mean what you think it means because subjectum, that's the Latin for it, is the hupokamenon in Greek, that which underlies, right? Uh, and it's, it's the thing that other things are predicated of or the thing that other things can, can be in, right? Like knowledge in, in your mind. And what we mean quite often is like subject versus object. And it's important to know that over the history of ideas, these terms have almost like flipped meaning in, in, in many cases, right? Um, so what, what we would call uh, an object in, in earlier times would be called a subject. Um, who's the first person to use it like in the term of subjectivity? I'm not quite sure. Um, certainly that's coming out quite a bit in the, the uh, modern age. It's becoming almost an obsession with them. What is, what is the subject? You know, what is personal identity? Um, you know, can we be sure of anything that we're knowing about the outside world or are we imprisoned within the realm of our ideas about it? Um, I don't know. It's a good question. I would hesitate to, to say any particular person it, just in part because uh, you know although the concept might be there they might not be using that particular term right all right uh sebastian a lot of kant stuff today do you think kant was right about the a priori synthetic statements uh, uh, what about the a priori synthetic statements that they exist that that they uh can be grounded or justified i mean what are you what are you asking uh it's not like kant just you know said a priori synthetic statements or propositions, and boom, there it is. He said an awful lot of stuff about that. Um, are you talking about you know the possibility of them, um, which is you know being dealt with in multiple works? Um, I think it's important when when we ask these questions to figure out exactly what we're asking about. Um, Kyle. Do you think it's accurate to say that Hegel's God is more of a ground of all being lower power than a higher power? Um, ground of all being. That sounds very Tillichian. Um, no, I wouldn't say that Hegel's God is more of a ground of all being than a higher power. I mean, Hegel doesn't think that miracles occur and he doesn't believe in God in you could say a classical theist sense as like a creator of everything um, but he does think of God as, as as definitely as a higher power that we sort of uh, come to recognize ourselves in the community as being so it's not just like a ground of being, you know, or like the thing that underlies everything else. Um, I'm not sure these, these, I'm not sure these are the best ways to describe Hegel's conception of God. Um, all right, David likes my jacket, uh, sweater. Yeah, this is the, the dude sweater from the Big Lebowski. My wife got it for me several Christmases ago. Um, and uh, it's very comfortable. Um, and the reason she got it for me is because so many people in videos were saying, well, this guy looks like the dude, right? <laughs> and I always meant to do some videos where I would like uh, take the glasses off and, uh, or maybe I'll use my old glasses that have more of the, the glasses like he had and, uh, you know, um, say a few things with, with the sort of dialect that, that he uses in there. But about philosophy or something like that. But, you know, like so many other things, I don't know if I'll, if I'll get to it. Um, Abdullah, how do I feel about people that call themselves philosophers even though they have no background in philosophy? Well, that used to really tick me off, right? Um, it used to really tick me off when somebody would say, my philosophy of coaching is blah, 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 because I'd be like, you don't know what the word philosophy means and, and you should stop using it. 
But I don't, I don't get too worked up about those sort of things anymore because it's not like uh, my getting upset about that is going to change the language or change their attitudes. It's better if I can actually steer them into studying some real philosophy. Um, and that's oftentimes done better by uh, engaging them in, in conversation. Um, I don't know too many people who call themselves philosophers these days, even though they have no background whatsoever in, in philosophy. I know a lot of people who get called philosophers by other people um, who don't have much of a background. Um, but that's because those people are ignorant of what philosophy actually is, or, or they're selling something. You know, they're, they're trying to peddle some, some wares, um, and they think philosophy sounds cool. I will say that it kind of does suck that um, there is a, I think it's a makeup or cosmetics or maybe uh, massage oils product line or maybe perfumes that has the name philosophy because it tends to screw up Google results, right? Uh, when, you're, when you're Googling actual philosophy. Um, but I think most people can very quickly tell the difference between those. All right, Beckley, uh, I recently got started in Stoic philosophy. I've read the end creating. It's some, sometimes hard to remember principles in real time. What would you suggest? Well, practice, 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 just like the end creating tells you. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, one of those things where the more that you do it, the better you get at it. Another thing that you might think about doing is um, sitting down and um, thinking about the more common situations that you find yourself in where afterwards you're like, damn, I wish I could have remembered that thing from Epictetus and then rehearse those ahead of time so that you actually will remember those. Um, you know, the Enchiridion is also incredibly short. It's easy to carry around on, on your phone or you could, I mean, it's literally the, the book that goes in your hand you could you could uh, do that as well, um, so that could be quite quite helpful as uh, you know as well. Um, and you know you, you're going to want to you're you're going to get more out of it the more Stoic philosophy you study. It's just, Stoic philosophy is a systematic whole. I was just actually posting about this uh, yesterday, or not yesterday, but um, today in the the article that I I wrote for Stoicism today. Seneca is asked by uh, Lucilius. Hey, can you give me some maxims? Now, maxims are these little quotes that, that people pop out, right? And there's a lot of people putting them on Twitter or Facebook, you know, with a little head of, of Epictetus. Oftentimes, they get Epicurus's head instead because they don't know the difference between the two. And then it'll have like a little line or something. And Seneca says, well, I don't really want to give you maxims because that's liable to mislead you. Stoic philosophy as a whole, it, you know, when you're only grasping a little part of it, it doesn't stick quite as well. And then he's like, well, but I'll, I'll give you some anyway, right? But just understand that these are all interconnected with each other. So the more that you study Stoic philosophy, and this would go for any sort of intentional way of life, whether it's philosophical, religious, or some, some other, uh, uh, you know, path where you're trying to restructure your, your uh, um, faculty of choice and restructure your thinking and restructure your emotions, there, there's going to be some sort of systematic, comprehensive thing, or or it's all bullshit. Right? <laughs> there's nothing systematic about it. Then it's just life hacky stuff, right? Um, in which case, you do whatever you want with that. But the real stuff is actually going to be rather systematic, and then you have to figure out how to to apply it. And the more that you do that, the, the better you're going to get at it. When you first start out, you're gonna you're gonna fail most of the time. That's just the way it is with with anything. Just like when you first go to the gym, uh, you're going to, you know, feel really uncomfortable and out of place on the machines. And then eventually you kind of figure out how they work and you start lifting more and more weight and your body is adapting itself. It's the same way with, with philosophies. So, all right, uh, 555327, have you ever left angry notes in the margins of philosophy books you disagreed with? Yes, I have. <laughs> Not for a long time, thankfully. I don't actually write much in books anymore, um, in part because I realize that I, I rarely, you know, find the stuff that I, I wrote previously in the books to be all that uh, helpful or insightful. And I'm like, man, who the hell wrote this crap, right? Um, 
And, uh, but I have, yeah, I, I've, I've done that with, with books. Um, I think the last time I did that, I was in graduate school. So it's been quite a while since I, I did that. Um, Jeremy, are you a fan of Philip K. Dick? If so, what's perhaps your favorite work? Yeah, I'm a big fan of Philip K. Dick. I mean, I've done uh, videos uh, about his 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 work, and I, I talk about him in, in a lot of different venues. So um, someday I'd actually like to do a Dick's, Dickensian glossary, and it would like be sort of a it'd be more than a glossary. It would be like all the different, you know, concepts from theology, philosophy, psychology, and a few other places that are in his, his works, little discussions of each of them. So that would aid, you know, a reader who doesn't actually have the sort of background that Dick himself had um, to be able to figure out what all the references are and what's going on in, in, in his works. Cause there's a lot of really, uh, there's a lot of things going on. Right. And I, I really like, Philip K. Dick, in part because he can take a, a concept and without sort of slavishly following it, he can embody it, he can have it be part of the dialogue, he can have it be part of the character's inner thought processes, and you can learn something about the philosophical or theological or whatever concept from reading his, his works. Um, I think that's really cool. And I think that's kind of rare, too. Um, other people, you know, you think about A. Van Voigt, uh, with you know his version of libertarianism in like the weapon shops of Isher and Nolle and that sort of thing, he was doing something kind of similar as well. And of course, he influenced Dick. Um, so yeah, I really I really enjoy Dick. Now, which which is my favorite work? I would have to say, if I could only pick one, and that is that is tough. I mean, I go back and forth. Which is it? At this point in time, I would say A Scanner Darkly. I mean, if you'd asked me a year ago, I would have said Man in the High Castle. And that's really a great work, too. Um, but Scanner Darkly, maybe more. Um, and there's, there's, you know, he, he's one of my guilty pleasure readings. Um, fortunately, we have a great, you know, collection of him in the library just down the road. So... All right, uh, Nicola, does Nietzsche support capitalism? I don't know if he critiques it. I know about socialism and equality. Socialism he interpreted as a political doctrine, and he was critical of that. He was critical of democracy. He was certainly critical of the, the modern tendency to reduce everything to its cash value, and uh, he would see capitalism as a, as a system. And remember, capitalism doesn't name just one system. It names a whole bunch of different systems, uh, that, that proceed from each other. There's no one single thing out there with a capital C, capitalism. But Nietzsche would say that that's just as crap as socialism is. Um, just as, as uh, conformist, just, and, and, I mean, you see this, you know, go on Twitter, for example, and uh, look at, look at the, the uh, capitalist apologist arguing with the socialist apologist. Almost all of them are just, you know, joiners and, you know, repeating sort of stock lines convinced of the rightness of their side, worshiping some, some, you know, thing that they think is going to, you know, somehow, you know, reward them for their, their self-abasement of, of posting continuously in its defense. Um, and, you know, and Nietzsche, I mean, Nietzsche probably would be willing to say that you might find some people of his you know, along the lines of his master morality or whatever, whatever it is that's supposed to come after that it, it, with a new transvaluation of values. Um, you might find people like that as captains of industry, but that's really more Ayn Rand than, than Friedrich Nietzsche. You know? <laughs> um, I think Nietzsche would, would look at, you know, a lot of these people as just like damaged, uh, goods who don't, I mean, here's the thing, Nietzsche and Marx actually go quite well together when we're thinking about like deformations of consciousness. So, I mean, so does Freud too, if you get away from some of the, the you know, crazy stuff and you actually take the things that are useful from, from him. And that's why Paul Ricoeur called Nietzsche, Marx and Freud, the, you know, masters of the hermeneutics of suspicion. Um, so, you know, um, now, there, there's another thing. Well, would Nietzsche then have been like against capitalism in the sense that he wouldn't have sold his books? No, he tried selling his books. Um, everyone has to earn a living. There's many ways of, of uh, critiquing or being against or partially divesting oneself from or trying to find an alternative to capitalism. 
and it's not an all or nothing thing. But yeah, I think in general, he would, he would have viewed it. And, and it's interesting because look at Mark Shaler, who is a Catholic phenomenologist um, who adopts Nietzsche and thinks Nietzsche has got a lot of things right. Read his, his short book, Resentiment, for that. Um, Shaler ties Nietzsche's critique directly to this, you know, um, new sort of industrial system of, of capitalism and talks about how, you know, the reduction of everything to, to essentially use value, utility, is, is a real problem. All right. I mean, let me say one other thing, too. What does Nietzsche support? Nietzsche supports the individual. And a lot of times today, uh, here in America especially, but it's also growing in other places. I mean, it's funny that, that they're like, you know, my, my Brazilian uh, colleagues and interlocutors were just a couple of years ago saying, there's a lot of people reading Ayn Rand down here. And I was like, really? What's going on with that? There's a lot of people who think that like capitalism fosters the individual. No, capitalism itself does not. Capitalism opens up certain spaces and then closes them off, quite frankly, very, very much of the time where individuals can thrive. Um, you know, the small business owner, the, the innovator, the, the person who is, is developing something new that is an expression of their desire to, to create, um, that's something that capitalism makes possible. So does socialism, just as much as capitalism does, because capitalism closes the doors for so many people, as does socialism, as do other things like, you know, Islamic clericalism or other ways of organizing the economy. Um, Nietzsche is interested in individuals who actually have some dynamicity to them, developing themselves and not taking their cues from, you know, say, reading, you know, uh, or actually misreading Adam Smith. Adam Smith would not be for anything, you know. <laughs> he, he would take a look at our capitalist system today and he'd be like, this is bullshit. This is not what I was talking about. Quit using me uh, in, in many respects. He was talking about small manufacturers and, and where there was, an, you know, uh, a focus on creating actual goods and services, not just on, a, on, you know, maximizing shareholder value or gobbling up all the other companies so you can keep them from innovating and threatening you or any, any of this sort of uh, stuff or the incredible interpenetration of corporations and our political system on, on both, you know, party sides. Um, Nietzsche, you know, and even Adam Smith would have said, that's, that's crap. Um, I'm interested in the value of, of individuals being able to creatively develop. So... All right, MJ, what measures can we take to truly understand philosophical arguments? There are certain arguments, no matter how hard I try, I find I cannot fully grasp. Is there a method you use? Well, maybe they're not arguments. Philosophy is way more than just arguments. It's also explanations. It's also accounts. It's also distinctions. It's also practical exercises and experimentation. So maybe you could be mistaking um, those things for arguments and trying to treat them like arguments and then being surprised when they're not as amenable to, to that treatment. I mean, the other thing is you gotta, you gotta work at the stuff. Um, some, some may be pre, if they are genuine arguments, they may be presupposing that you have background knowledge about something and there's no one size fit all for this, but just keeping at it and, and trying to, you know, learn more about, um, uh, the, uh, the, the stuff that you're working with um, and then eventually getting your head around it. And maybe you only get your head around it halfway. That's still making some progress though, isn't it? All right. Uh, Arjanus, where does Foucault begin? Is, is it his epistemology to culminate with the death of the subject? Um, well, I mean, you can read his early stuff, right? Um, and uh, read, um, you can also read like the, the forewords and like conclusions as well that, that'll give you some idea. Nietzsche was really important for Foucault. He talks about this, I believe, in Madness and Civilization, um, or it might be in Discipline and Punish. He's talking about like the, the effect that, that like Nietzsche had coming onto the scene again, not because he wasn't like coming onto the scene for the first time, for his, um, his, his generation of, of, of intellectuals who are, you know, 
at that time you had you know sort of structuralism going on you had these hegelians and marxists out there you had existentialists and um you know nietzsche didn't fit in neatly into to any of those i understand so oh he was an existentialist yeah but existentialism is a wide movement right um and the nietzsche that they're interested in is the one who's doing cultural critique so I would say that that's part of it. And then Foucault himself, it's funny, he says, I'm not a structuralist. He's as structuralist as hell in, in the archaeology of knowledge and the order of things. I mean, you can actually create Gramassian squares out of what he's doing. So, so it, you know, he's, he's doing a little bit of lying to, to his audience and saying, I'm not a structuralist. But he's drawing on that and he's trying to be, he's trying to go beyond that, you know. Um, so now where does he begin? He begins by doing research, begins by going to archives, by studying, by not taking things for granted as the narrative of how things actually are, but, but actually reading texts. One of the good things about Foucault is um, he's not always right about stuff. As a matter of fact, I think quite often he's drawn wrong conclusions about some things, um, but he will direct you to get to some of the interesting texts that you want to read along the way. And sometimes he actually is right about things. Um, distinction between different modes of exercise of power, I think, is really great. The notion of technologies of the self, not unique to him, but but the way he's doing it, pretty good stuff. Um, you know, I like I like his his uh, project. All right, Becky Beckley, do the Stoics have any advice for letting go of resentment? A resentment? Yeah, you got to examine uh, why your resentment is arising and uh, figure out what you can actually do about that, where, where the uh, assumptions that you're making are off base. Uh, then you have to practice, 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 practice. And it's probably good to actually find a community of people who are engaged in, in similar sort of things. Um, any intentional way of living as a philosophy involves a lot of practicing, a lot of uh, self-scrutiny, a lot of trying to make some progress along the way. So that's that's part of it. And, and actually Epictetus and Seneca themselves have a lot to say, so does Marcus Aurelius, about anger and resentment and how it arises. And they give you a lot of different techniques that you can use. I have a video that you can, you can check out um, from Stoicon 2016. It was a workshop session that I did specifically on Stoicism and anger that might be helpful for you as well. Um, let's see, Tyler asks, is Descartes' race extensa about dualism? Yeah, well, it is. I mean, race extensa is, is uh, things that are extended, material things, not thought. Descartes' ontology is pretty simple and straightforward. You got extended substances, you got thinking substances, and you got God, whatever God happens to be. Um, and then, you know, how do we connect up the the extended and the, the thought? That's, you know, the pineal gland. <laughs> or however else we're going to do it, you know. there's And this is one of the things where the Cartesians themselves had to come up with different ideas. I mean, Spinoza, who is a Cartesian, right, his very first book, Principles of Cartesian Philosophy, he's like, well, this isn't going to work. They're both aspects of the same thing. Um, and there's just one of them, by the way. Uh, Malbranche has this occasionalism, right? Different people have uh, other, other accounts to try to make sense of it. Tony asks, are there any good philosophical conferences held in the Midwest? Yeah, sure. Um, and you can, you can think of them in, in three different ways. So there's traveling conferences, right, which are good conferences most of the time anyway. And sometimes they're in the Midwest and sometimes they're in other places. Like I like to go to the American Catholic Philosophical Association, not only because the papers, uh, if it's a good theme and, and a good committee are usually pretty, pretty good stuff, um, but they have all these satellite sessions, you know, that I like to go to, like the Etienne Gilson Society or the, the Institute for St. Anselm Studies will have a session or <clears throat> the um, Gabriel Marcel Society, right? And I've presented at a number of those. Um, now, if it's a crap theme, then, you know, it's probably not going to be very good. But, you know, it, it's been in different places. I mean, in, in recent years, uh, it was here in, in uh, Milwaukee just, um, 
how many years ago? It was like 2007, I think. So 12 years ago. Um, I think they're in South Bend sometime in the future. I don't know. I, I, I only check if I've got something that I think I can send out there. So I don't follow it too closely. But you also have the you know, American Philosophical Association. There's all sorts of other good organizations. And I, what I mean by good is not, I mean, the APA, I'm not really bullish on them, but you can find some interesting stuff, right? You can find some stuff that's worth going to. And it travels around, right? Sometimes uh, the Central Division will be at the Palmer House Hilton down in Chicago. So that's one kind of uh, good conference to go to. And then you have the state um, philosophical associations. I can only talk about the Wisconsin Philosophical Association and the Indiana Philosophical Association. I used to be very active in the IPA, and I occasionally go to the Wisconsin one. Um, you know, those, those are decent. Um, you can, you know, meet some local people and every state has one. It's worth checking out. I've also been to the North Carolina uh, Philosophical Association when I was living down there. Um, and then you have other conferences that are really well worth looking at and going to because um, they have, they are, they're always like the same place. So I'll give you an example of this. Every summer, whether I'm presenting or not, I go to Marquette's Aristotle and the Aristotelian Tradition Conference because it's amazing. And um, it's, it's you know, fairly inexpensive to go, and it's, it's really worth going to. Um, and it's here in Milwaukee, hosted at Marquette University, and it lasts three days. And I get to see some, some top-notch Aristotle and other scholars presenting on things. And maybe sometimes I give a paper and I chat with people and catch up with them. So you just got to like, you know, keep your eyes open for, for the different things that, that are available. Um, if you're in Indiana, uh, South Bend, Notre Dame has quite a few conferences on their campus that are, that are quite good. Um, sometimes they're, they're a bit more pricey, of course. Um, and so you just got to, you know, keep, keep your eye out for that sort of thing. But there's, yeah, there's plenty of good philosophical conferences in the Midwest. Uh, Dan the Man, do I have any thoughts on anthroposophy? Several years ago, my high school philosophy teacher was an anthroposophy professor. Well, that's quite a, a thing. Um, yeah, so what we're talking about there is Rudolf Steiner's uh, uh, system. And I think that Steiner had a f some interesting things to say. I was going to say a few, but actually there's, there's some more than just a few. But I think I don't buy into his his system. And I think most of the people who are doing it are very new agey types. Um, it's more of a belief system than an actual, you know, uh, well-reasoned, evidentially based kind of, kind of system. Um, Steiner was kind of a, let's draw everything in and see if we can like rework it. And it's very comprehensive, you know, all the way uh, from, you know, theories of color, which, which are quite interesting. Um, he was very influenced by, by Goethe's color theory, you know, um, to music, to agriculture, to this and that. And it's all based on sort of a theory of correspondences. I have actually been to the Goetheanum in Dordnacht uh, in Switzerland uh, and visited that, you know, while I was uh, nearby in, in, in uh, Bern. Um, and... Um, you know, it's it's interesting stuff. I don't buy any of it myself, but I know I know people who do. All right. Um, how can we, this is from Ava? How can we be more aware of our faults, flaws, and character and approach to how we see and interpret the world if we can't ask friends and have to rely on our own limited POV? Well, there's nothing that says you can't ask friends. Um, you know, you you can ask your friends. They may not always give you good answers, but you know, you can find other people. Um, I would say you probably do need to become part of a community. Um, and, you know, you can also find a lot of resources for engaging in some self-scrutiny um, from philosophical or religious or psychological uh, traditions. There's, there's many different options available out there. And, and some of them, you know, you might not buy totally into it. Like, you know, think about positive psychology, right? This, the, you know, selling man stuff. So I think a lot of that is, is, is actually not very science, not scientific, like it pretends to be, because it relies so much on like self-reporting and, and all of that. And I think that the, the emphasis on like a preponderance of positive over negative emotions, 
and the stress on like getting rid of negative emotions. I think that's in some ways misguided. Um, and I think the way that they define things is, is off base, but can you like take their inventories and learn something from them? Sure. You know, you don't have to buy into their, their thing in order to get something out of it. So it, it can be useful. Um, uh, Bobbin uh, asks, why are we conscious of the world at all as opposed to being unconscious animals, so to speak? Um, who says animals are unconscious? I mean, the classical definition of animals are sentient beings. <laughs> so I, don't, I don't know. I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure where that's coming from, but it's the kind of being that we are. Um, why, why are we conscious of the world at all? Because we respond to it and we're engaged with it. Um, by the time that we can frame that as a, as an issue, um, there isn't any live possibility of us as the beings that we are being unconscious of it. Right. Uh, Zama asks, what do I think about Freud about how his theories affected philosophical thinking? Oh, well, that's a, that's a really interesting one. So like, I'll go on the record right now and say, I think the Oedipus complex stuff was all nonsense. You know, maybe, maybe there's a, some people who, who do in fact genuinely have an Oedipus complex, but I think Freud really oversold that one, you know, and, uh, the stages, you know, of development, <laughs> I think that's, that's, you know, in his hydraulic theory of, of repression and emotions or affectivity. There's a lot of things where we can be like, yeah, Freud, mm, not, not buying it. And a lot of that stuff was the stuff that caught on, right? Um, I will say this. I do think the notion that we have unconscious desires that can be brought to light through depth psychology is a very good insight. I do think that Freud furnished some, some useful ideas and insights that could be taken up by other authors and transformed and, and made more powerful. I think that Freudianism is, you know, it turned into something almost like its own sort of religion, right? With its own high, high priesthood and uh, initiations and things like that. But I don't think that, that it's all nonsense. Alistair McIntyre, who, who does in fact take Freud seriously. I, you know, the, when I was in that seminar with him, um, there were three, Alistair McIntyre always likes to contrast three things against each other. So um, we looked at rational choice theory and its origins in Humean and Hobbesian, you know, ways of looking at things. And we looked at Aristotelian Thomism. And then we looked at Freud and Lacan. And now why would McIntyre be, well, also Winnicott too and, and Klein and people like that. Why would McIntyre be interested in it? Because he actually took that notion of unconscious desire seriously as well. And he saw that the Freudians, um, sometimes even despite themselves, were able to produce some results. Now people, oh, you know, they've been scientifically debunked. Kinda, but also kinda not, right? Um, depends on how you, how you construe it. Um, you don't want to rely on popular science uh, or popular psychology stuff for, for your assessment of them. Um, McIntyre um, noted that, that within, and this is in his book, The Unconscious, that because of the prevalence of Freudianism and all of his sort of spin-offs and acolytes and people doing similar things, um, there is this tendency for an appeal to Freudian concepts to justify what one was doing. I'm, I'm doing this because I'm repressed. You know? um, and, and, you know, I mean, people do this today, right? They, they, uh, they bring in things from, from other um, psychological theories as well. So look at all the stuff about triggering and PTSD, you know, and, and you get, you know, serious combat vets and rape survivors telling all these people who say, I, I, my latte didn't come out right, I'm triggered, or somebody said something mean to me, I'm triggered. And they're like, you're not triggered, you know, that it actually means something to, to those of us. But there, there's a tendency for this to happen with, with um, ideas. They, they make their way into the popular culture, and then they become part of the way we relate to each other. So um, now philosophical thinking. People, some people thought they should take Freud seriously. Others thought that uh, they didn't need to. <clears throat> and... Um, you know, a lot of uh, continental thinkers have used Freud in one way or another. Um, some like Sartre would, you know, contrast what he was doing 
and his existential uh, psych, um, existential psychoanalysis, existential psychology from what the Freudians were doing. Um, so, and, and John Wisdom actually um, was quite interested in Freud as well on the analytic side. Um, so, you know, there's been quite an, an important influence. All right, uh, Gabriel, you mentioned uh, that you do not, you once mentioned you do not agree with emanation when speaking of Neoplatonism. Can you discuss your thoughts on why emanation doesn't work for you? Well, I'm not a, I'm not a Neoplatonist of that sort. I just don't buy this, you know, like you've got the one and then you've got these various emanations coming out of it. There's nothing really uh, mysterious about it. I just don't, don't find those accounts. They're interesting, but I just don't find them uh, compelling. Um, Bertrand, why is it most philosophy departments only give tenure to Ivy Leaguers over everyone else and make it difficult for people who went to state schools to move up to working at a prestigious place? Well, that's not the case. Um, <laughs> philosophy departments give tenure on the basis of uh, research, tenure, service, and where you got your degree from is probably not going to determine whether they give you tenure or not. I, I'm not sure where that idea is coming from. Um, as a matter of fact, when you see Ivy Leaguers at smaller institutions, watch them carefully. There's probably a reason why they couldn't get a, a, a higher tier job, you know, and very often they don't stay. They're, they're looking at those as sort of stepping stones. Um, and, and, you know, smart uh, search committees know that um, or tenure committees. No, it's more difficult for people who went to. You know, and it's not so so much Ivy League versus state schools. Some state schools may as well be Ivy League. You know, uh, UW Madison, for example, um, when it comes to philosophy, certain areas of it, you know, they have just as much prestige as as somebody coming from Dartmouth. You know, or even even you know, the Ivy Leaguers aren't all in the same league either. Um, it's more like uh, Ivy. It's more like elites. Let's call it versus non elites. And that has more to do with whether, whether you get in, whether you get your foot in the door, and less to do with whether you get tenure. Once you're in the door, you can you know, do what you're going to do and show them that you're, you're actually valuable. Getting in the door is the tricky part. Um, getting to work at a prestigious place when you don't have a pedigree that they like, that's the tough part. So... Um, Oh, was, was it Oysen O'Toole? What would you think of like a philosopher's mass, like a church meeting type thing, just to meet, discuss, and talk about daily problems with solutions and practical philosophy like those of the Stoics? Well, I wouldn't say it's like mass, but I would say that the meetings of the Stoic Fellowship, there's chapters all over the world, including here in Milwaukee, are like that. It's what we do. It's <laughs> also what we do in uh, Sophia, another organization uh, Society of Philosophers in America that has chapters all over the place, including here in Milwaukee. There's there's people doing that sort of thing. There have been people doing that for, for quite a while. Um, and I think it would be great to have more of that. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's one of the things I want to try to promote here, <clears throat> more in the Milwaukee area. Um, but it's it's certainly something that's already going on. And could it be more like a mass where you had a rather structured liturgy? I think it could. Um, but that might turn some people off. It's, it's not like Stoicism has a uh, um, brevery or, or, you know, an order of, of ritual or something like that. So, um, you know, it, it kind of varies from place to place. But that's, that's what a lot of people are doing. All right, uh, Maxim, thoughts on Gödel Escher Bach, great book. Uh, we actually spent a whole semester on it when I was a uh, undergraduate because I was a mathematics as well as a philosophy major. And so we did a, a special seminar and we worked our way through Gödel Escher Bach. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I really enjoyed that. As I, as, as I remember, it was like a spring semester and uh, it was like a night class. I think it met once a week or so. And um, I just remember it being really cold, when, cold and dark when we'd get out of class. Um, but it's a, that's a great book. So um, Beckley, can we practice philosophy in conjunction with therapy? Many of us do. As a matter of fact, um, you know, 
a lot of ancient philosophy is conceived as therapy for the soul. Um, psychology comes out of philosophy. So, yeah. <laughs> Made of clay. Is the postmodern scapegoating or blaming justified? Also, why is postmodernism synonymous with nihilism? Because uh, people are stupid and they don't know what postmodernism means. And they probably don't even know what nihilism means. The people who are like, you know, on the right who are saying, oh, postmodernism is the cause of this and that and this and that, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Um, they've probably, you know, they probably even haven't read Wikipedia articles on the people that they think are responsible for the decline of Western civilization. And they're not representative of, of anything valuable in Western civilization, even if they happen to every once in a while break out Cicero or, or the Stoics or something like that. Um, this is something I've talked about, you know, many times. You can certainly criticize, you know, postmodernism once you have an idea of what, what it means and what, what it encompasses. But until then, it's just sort of, you know, saying, I don't like, I don't like blah, 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 blah you know. It's, it's bleeding of goats, basically. Um, and it's, it's funny, too, because if you look in certain circles, what a lot of people today are complaining about is, as postmodernism was previously called modernism, <laughs> you know, an equally ambiguous term, you know. Um, so it's whenever I hear people, you know, like going off on postmodernism, I know they don't know what the, the odds are they don't know what the hell they're talking about. So is it justified? No. Um, are there things that we should certainly, you know, criticize or complain about? Sure. But we do those, you know, in a, in a less blanket way, right? Uh, Sango, what do I know about Mishima Yukio? Nothing. Um, so can't say anything about that. Uh, Shadowlink. I'm trying to start Hegel with your half-hour Hegel series. I'm wondering how relevant you believe Hegel study is to today. Should I be studying this over and over again in parts? Hegel's relevant. Um, Hegel's difficult too, so you got to evaluate whether you want to spend the time on it. And, and I don't think that you, you know, you're not living a good philosophical life if you've never read Hegel, right? Um, but he's, he's, you know, he's an important person and, and he's got some interesting things to contribute. So that's one of those things where you got to decide yourself whether you want to do it. Uh, Adam, would I agree that philosophy and love are ultimately tragic? No, I would say some love is tragic and some philosophy is tragic. Um, and uh, it's interesting. Hannah Arendt, um, in one of her letters, I think it was, or maybe in an address, I've got it bookmarked on my other computer. She talks about philosophy and love, and friendship, and what was the other one? Maybe poetry, as being oases in the desert of contemporary life. Um, and so, you know, they, they provide us with a place to replenish ourselves, a place to get the nourishment that is so often lacking in modern society. Uh, in part because things have become homogenized and, and the depth has been taken out of them. Um, I think it's a really profound insight. <clears throat> so if that's the case, maybe the tragedy lies outside of philosophy, right? Love, of course, can go wrong. Um, philosophy can go wrong. Anything, everything is vulnerable to, to that. But the idea that they would be inherently or ultimately tragic, I don't, I don't think so. Um, all right, Shaf, I'm 15 and tried reading Thus Spoke Zarathustra, but did not understand much. Is it because of my low vocabulary? Um, I mean, vocabulary can be an issue. Um, and, and vocabulary can be an issue in, in two ways. It could be you, just, you don't know what the word is, right? Um, so, And that's something you can remedy pretty easily, I think. The other problem that arises quite often with um, philosophy is that the, the thinker is using words that we might think we know what they mean, but they're used in a different way. And that, that philosopher is, um, you know, sometimes much more technical way in that philosopher's uh, works. And so then you read it and you're like, so I understand what these words mean, but they don't add up. Right. And, and that's sometimes that, that gets better with familiarization. If you're reading stuff at 15 years old, um, that's, that's good, but you're not going to get everything out of it that you might get when you're 30. And, and that's okay. 
there's no remedy for that, right? There's no there's no shortcuts. There's no skipping ahead. Um, but if you keep at it and and keep keep studying it, you will understand more. And maybe read some other things as well from from Nietzsche, or read some secondary literature on it to to help you with it. Um, all right, uh, Kay Franklin. What would you suggest as an entry point to philosophy for a new armchair philosopher? Um, well, I don't know what an armchair philosopher even means, um, but a, an entry point. Pick anywhere you like. I mean, wherever you enter in, uh, you're not going to understand three quarters of what you're reading at first, and you're going to have to go back to it later anyway. Um, pick something you, you, you're going to enjoy. Um, if you like... You know, novels, find somebody who's who's a novelist who references philosophy, like Iris Murdoch, for example, or, you know, uh, G.K. Chesterton, or, um, Philip K. Dick. Or, you know, if, if you want to read some classic philosophy, read some classic philosophy. It doesn't, you know, there's no, like, re requirement of where you're going to start. There's no best place, quite quite frankly. And if you like, you know, like, histories of, of ideas, um, <clears throat> you know, where, where it's kind of a summary of stuff, Start with one of those, because even if it's crap, like, you know, William Durant's Story of Philosophy, I read that when I was an undergraduate, and I was like, well, this is really great stuff. And then I read the philosophers he was talking about, and I was like, well, he got that wrong and that wrong and that wrong. At least he got something going, right? Um, same thing with, like, Bertrand Russell's History of Philosophy. I think he's wrong on a lot of points, but, you know, he's, he's a good writer, and he'll get you interested in things. Just don't, like, take his this is this way as, as gospel or anything like that. Or you might like read some popular works, um, and they might get the philosophy wrong too, right? Like Plato at the Googleplex, or Swerve, or uh, any of those you know things that are supposed to be about you know philosophy written by a philosopher, New York Times bestseller list. Can't hurt, you know, so long as you don't necessarily believe that they've got it right. So, all right. Uh, Jeremy, what are some excellent works of literature written by non-philosophers that touch on some existentialist concepts? Well, there's people in the existentialist tradition like Franz Kafka, right? Um, and, uh, of course, Rainer Maria Rilke is, is in there as well. Um, you know, Fyodor Dostoevsky was not a philosopher, um, but he's important in the existentialist canon. And... Um, you know, I mean, Philip K. Dick is is somebody who, who often gets referenced in, in that as well. But, I, you know, it's not something I've given a lot of thought to. Depends on what we mean by existentialist. If we're talking about, like, being responsible for our choices, then I would say Graham Greene, you know, fits into that. But Greene, I, I think if you were to call him an existentialist, he'd be like, don't associate me with those degenerates, <laughs> you know. Um, so there's, there's, there's a number of, of, of people that you could – you could pick up on with that. Um, I'm not a big reader of contemporary fiction, so I, I don't, you know, if, if it's been published since 1950, odds are I haven't read it. Just, you know, unless it's sci-fi stuff or fantasy that I was interested in. All right. Um, Beckley asks, when you found out about James Stockdale's prison stint in Vietnam and his credit to the Uncaridian, for making him endure brutal conditions, what impression did you have? Well, I found out about that as I was reading through the book that I was going to be teaching my, my prison students um, at uh, Indiana State Prison, uh, and I was, you know, quite impressed. I had known Stockdale as this guy who was Ross Perot's running mate, and man, did that make a bad impression when he was in the vice presidential debates. Um, and I was very pleasantly surprised to find out that he was such a good writer and that he had used Epictetus. At that time, I was, I was interested in Stoicism, but I was not, you could say, attracted to Stoicism the way I was in the prison. But many of my students in the prison were not only attracted to Stoicism, but studying Stoicism. And, uh, you know, Stockdale, they, they, they responded to him quite a bit. Um, okay, let's see here. The... the line of things just jumped and I've lost my place. Let's get myself back to, uh, do, do, oh, there's a lot of questions here. We're not going to be able to get to all of these, but, um, all right. 
Crollo, how do I start with studying the postmodernist philosophers? Um, well, figure out who the postmodernist philosophers are to begin with. Um, and uh, some of them are not going to call themselves postmodern. They'll get labeled as postmodern by somebody else. Like, for example, Derrida, right? Derrida doesn't call himself a postmodern. Um, he, he says he's doing deconstruction. He's doing other things. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say that one good avenue into that is to get Friedrich Jameson's postmodernism book, which is you know, pretty thick, and it's got all these nice references within it and explanations, and he sets out different models of what postmodernism would be. And um, then, you know, like when you see something that you like there, say, oh, I want to like follow up on that line. And then that could be useful for you. Um, Bob, and what are we supposed to do about the fact we can't know exactly what we should do at every moment in time or even in general and the anxiety this develops? Right. Well, um, realize that that doesn't have to make you anxious because not everybody is anxious in relation to that or caused by that. And then start looking at people who aren't made anxious by that, but actually do have that, that insight and um, see how they do things. Talk to them. See if you can adopt some of those uh, views for yourself. <clears throat> um, Valdemar, I've not heard you talk about the Neoplatonists, so what are your thoughts on Plotinus and Proclus and their pals? You probably have done this somewhere along your thousands of vids. I haven't done anything on them. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a specialist. I read them, you know, and I, I do read them every every once in a while. I find Plotinus very interesting, um, but I'm, you know, I'm not attracted to that kind of Neoplatonism. Um, I, I'm, you know, if you had to say, well, what kind of Platonist are you? I'm more of a middle Platonist, like Plutarch, you know, um, kind of eclectic, and and you know, so yeah. All right. Uh, Bill Martins, why would Aristotle be a first wave feminist? Um, well, I'm not sure he would be a first wave. I guess, I guess if he if he's a feminist, he would have to be first wave because he's before the you know second wave. Point in fact, Aristotle isn't a feminist. Um, he says a lot of you know clearly off base things about the natural inferiority of women. Um, things that he probably, given his actual method and his principles, would have rejected were he here in the present. Um, I've actually done talks on what I call Aristotle's woman problem. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not sure where that that um, is coming from. But, I, you know, when we talk about first wave feminism, we're thinking about the drive for equality. It's, it's less about, you know, it's more about bringing, you know, undoing social structures that keep women back. Think about Mary Wollstonecraft, for example, right? Undoing these vicious cycles that, that deprive women of opportunities to develop, which then would allow them to, to actually be equals. Um, I mean, Wollstonecraft and Aristotle are both virtue ethicists. And, and Wollstonecraft actually not only says that most, you know, most women are unable to develop in, in, in their intellects and moral capacities in, in the type of uh, social structures that we we are living in back then. She also says most men are too, right? Um, so, all right, Sebastian, have you read Naming and Necessity by Kripke? Is it worth uh, reading for someone interested in philosophy of language? Yeah, I read it in graduate school. I'm not a fan of Kripke. Um, he's interesting. He's, he's somebody who, you know, sure, if you're going to do philosophy of language, read him along with 100 other people, right? Um, it's, it's okay. Um, but he's, he's got an interesting book too on Wittgenstein in private language. That's worth reading too. Uh, Adam, do I feel stupid and confused after all these years do studying and doing philosophy? Uh, occasionally, you know, um, but not often. I mean, I, I know, you know, what I do know and I know how much I, 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 I'm, I've missed out on and don't know and won't have the time to actually study and read. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm kind of happy because with the stuff that I've committed to and, and read, although I don't have all the answers and all of the proper orientations to things, I have quite a few of them and, and I'm relatively happy with um, what I've got going. So, yeah. Uh, Daniel Cox, can you recommend any books on agape love or political theology? I don't, I don't know how those are connected together. Agape, I mean, 
you could start with uh, if you if you if you want to distinguish that rigidly from other types of love, read C.S. Lewis's The Four Loves, and that'll get you started. Uh, and then it'll refer you back to Anders Nigren and and um, you know other thinkers who are making this distinction. I mean, I don't really. I don't think that there's a rigid distinction in Greek stuff, even in the New Testament, between these different kinds of love. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's, it's okay. Uh, Oisin O'Toole, thoughts on a united Ireland? I don't have any thoughts on that. Um, I'm not, a, you know, I, I, genetically I'm Irish, but, uh, you know, I, I was raised in a family that's uh, French-Canadian um, in, in ethnicity. And uh, I think the Irish have to sort their own stuff out. You know, I don't have any. I don't have any any insight to contribute to them. Um, all right, uh, Benjamin Dale. I take it you know how to read Latin. Did you find it hard to learn? I didn't find it hard to learn, but I have a facility with languages, and I also kind of you know had some bits and pieces here along the way too. So. Like when I was in seventh, in sixth and seventh grade, I went to a school where we studied Latin, um, and it you know it was kind of like baby Latin, you could say, right? Um, like we didn't even learn the third declension until the second year. <laughs> so, um, but you know, I had that, and then um, when did I really start studying it in earnest? Um, oh yeah, when I was in graduate school, I, I found an old. Uh, JAG officer army field manual to teach yourself Latin. And I used that and made some progress with that. And then immediately went to try to read Cicero and uh, found that I was way in over my head. And then instead of like taking classes, what I did is I just got the, the uh, um, Latin grammar, Alan and Greeno, and worked my way through it, example after example, principle after principle. But by then I was already doing Indo-European linguistics. So that, you know, that made it a lot easier for me. Um, so, and then, you know, you read authors and you learn more stuff along the way. So, all right. Uh, Aristotle says that all men by desire, by nature desire to know. Any idea how he came to that? Self-evident, inductive, no idea. I mean, that's the beginning of the metaphysics. Um, I would say it's probably an, an inductive statement, or maybe it's an, what we call an endoxa that he took from somebody else whose texts we don't have. Although usually Aristotle mentions his sources. So, um, okay, Bobbin asks, why do you think there were so many Lutheran philosophers but not Calvinists? I don't know where you get that idea from. There were plenty of Calvinist philosophers. Um, you know, you just got to start digging, and you'll you'll find plenty of them. John Calvin himself conceives of what he's doing as as a Christian philosophy. Uh, Mark Trumbull, uh, what is the connection between Aristotle's four causes, the unmoved mover, and self thinking thought? So that's a big scope question. I mean, the unmoved mover would be, you know, in a way the the efficient cause. Aristotle says at some points that maybe God is like the the you know this this final cause as well. Um, self-thinking thought, I'm never really sure what to make of self-thinking thought, you know, or, you know, noesis, uh, uh, thinking about itself. Um, it's not something I find particularly attractive about Aristotle's philosophy, quite frankly. He, you know, he's, he's, he's got a lot of great tools and then he's got this sort of like, well, we're going to do this contemplative philosophy over here, theoretical philosophy. And, you know, the goal is to be like God, you know, thought, thinking itself, disengaged. And then you're like, well, what's all this other stuff over here that you're so good at? Um, all right, Lou, what do I think of marijuana? Does it help? open up your mind in respect to new ways of thinking. I mean, if it does, then you didn't, you were really badly off to begin with, I would say. Um, you don't need it in order to do that, but it could be a useful cause, I suppose, for some people. Um, but, you know, I guess so could drinking or so could meth in that case, right? So could so many other things. Um, I think, you know, the, the main use for marijuana, there's really a couple. One is to alleviate pain, and we're discovering that it's quite good for, for things and could be a way to get people off of these opioids. Um, I'm all for that. And then, you know, it's a recreational drug. People like getting high. 
Um, and there's a lot of that here in Milwaukee, man. You can walk out on the street and just get, you know, almost a contact high at some points, especially if you're going to a concert. Um, I never, I never really was that interested in it. You know, I tried it uh, sometimes, but I found that the people that were really into it were kind of dull. And so I, you know, when I was in graduate school, for example, I much preferred drinking than to, to smoking. Um, but that was me. Um, okay. So here's a question. Dudes, how many pages of philosophy do you need to read to be considered an intellectual? I don't know. You tell me when you find that out. <laughs> that's, that's like, you know, uh, so, so, uh, far away from, <laughs> is there like a, a body out there who, who affirms somebody to be an intellectual? All right, so there's lots and lots and lots of questions. I'm about 10 minutes out from uh, ending this, this session. So I'm just going to like jump around now. So a lot of people are, you're not going to get your questions answered. Um, I tried to answer them in the order that I did, but you'll, um, you'll just have to, you know, get in on the next one. I'll take what I can do. Um, and we'll just jump around a bit. And I'm actually going to scroll down to... Uh, the bottom and then start scrolling up. Um, let's see here. Stuff I can easily address. <clears throat> um, oh, here's a good one from Russell. What's the good life? Is there one singular good life? I don't think there is one singular good life, but I think there's like, you could say a, a family of good lives connected to each other. And there will be some common elements to it. I think that, you know, Aristotle and the other virtue ethicists are right, that virtue is going to play a part in that. That's a term that often turns a lot of people off because they've got like, you know, moralistic conceptions of virtue associated with that. Um, but if you look at what the, the actual, you know, philosophers say about, about the virtues, you can see how they would, they would be conducive to that. It also does take some luck, some fortune, you know, as Theophrastus recognized um, but that's, that's, yeah, that's about it. Um, let's see here. Do, do, do. Brian asks, do I have an opinion on antinatalism? Uh, you know, the people who, uh, uh, are super for it, they can practice that all they want, right? Uh, here's a good one. Thomas, do I still plan to do a series on Maurice Blondel? Yeah, I mean, I plan to do a lot of things on a lot of things. It's a matter of finding the time and, and getting to it. Um, the more financially independent of having to hustle and, and work and teach and stuff like that that I am through things like Patreon, the more uh, feasible that that sort of thing becomes. Um, let's see. Um, Do, do, do. Oh, Alex, would I like to speak about Meister Eckhart and Christian mystics? Not really. I had a, a good friend when I was in graduate school who actually wrote his dissertation on Meister Eckhart, and we talked quite a bit about it, but I'm not attracted to mysticism. Um, I know a lot of other people are. More power to them. Um, I'm, I'm just not interested in, in doing that, that sort of thing. And there's probably way better people in, in, in that, that field. Uh, Victor asked, do I think a philosophy minor would be worth pursuing? Yeah, definitely. Um, philosophy major is worth pursuing. I just published a post uh, the other day in our Excess DNO Etique about this weird assumption that we have that, you know, the only use for a philosophy degree would be like to teach philosophy and how strange an assumption that is. Um, all right, here's a good one from Nikki. Do you think advances in neuroscience could at some point help us to get past some of the brick walls we seem stuck on from trying to explain and understand consciousness from the experience side? Nah, I, don't, I doubt it. I, I mean, insofar as it's neuroscience, it's not going to help us explain consciousness. It can help us explain some of the things that are going on that are correlates to consciousness, but 
uh, you know, and, and neuroscience is one of those terms. It names everything from like really rigorous research to complete bullshit that just has the words neuro attached to everything and everything in between. So, you know, there's a lot of people who have some really incredibly optimistic, you know, hopes for what neuroscience is going to do. And, and it's just a like a repeat of the positivism of, of previous ages with different kinds of science involved. Um, I think neuroscience will eventually sort of like come into its own and um, be, be reintegrated into the, the other sciences. And, you know, semiotics, you know, will, will be just as important as, as neuroscience and people will talk across those fields. So, you know, that, that'll be good. Um, all right. Um, Uh, C says, how can we find balance with the principles of categorical imperative and utilitarianism when utilitarianism is about sacrificing one for all? Well, utilitarianism isn't about sacrificing one for all. That's not what it's about. It's about, you know, doing what's going to benefit the greatest number. In some cases, that doesn't require sacrificing one for all. In some cases, that does require sacrificing a whole bunch for the totality. Um, and how are you going to find balance? There isn't a balance between them. You know, you pick one or pick the other or pick some other point of view. That's one of those fundamental differences between them. You can't balance everything out against each other. Uh, Penn Spinner, can I, have I read Max Stirner's The Ego in Its Own? And if yes, what's your opinion on it? So, yeah, I've read Stirner, and, and it, it's an interesting work. Um, it, and he is, you know, very consistent, which you know I like. Uh, in in the way that he's working things out, some people have suggested that he should be viewed as a as a, an existentialist and brought into the existentialist canon. I, I, I you know I'm willing to be convinced further along those those lines. Um, I, you know, I, I get what he's doing and I find what he's doing interesting, but I I don't really buy buy it. But I think there's things where we can draw on it, with the critical stuff where it's 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 quite useful. Uh, Oliver, do I watch Rick and Morty or Game of Thrones? Uh, if so, how do you like the shows? I watch both of them. Um, I enjoy Rick and Morty quite a bit. Um, I'm not happy with, you know, the sort of dickish behavior of a lot of Rick and Morty fans thinking that because they've grasped, you know, some of the clever jokes in there that they're cleverer than everybody else. Um, but I suppose that's that's liable to happen with many kinds of shows. Game of Thrones, I like, you know, I like being able to watch it. I'm not, I'm not happy about how off book they are. Uh, and I'm not happy about the fact that we've now got effectively two different storylines um, where like totally different things have happened and things are being reinterpreted in, in multiple ways. Um, I suppose it's, it's, you know, a factor of the time that we live in. We're, we're lucky that we actually have so many cool series to watch, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a fan of the book series than I am of the, the, um, show itself. Um, all right, let's see what else we'll, uh, take here. Um, Oh, man. So here's a good one from Killing Addiction. I've studied philosophy for nearly 30 years and taught it for the past 10 as a professor. I'm curious to hear about your biggest complaints or frustrations as someone who has also taught philosophy. So, you know, with, on the teaching end, I will say the frustrations come in part from, you know, colleagues in administration and in part from students. And with the students, it's more like, you know, you give them all these great resources, and then they they don't they don't read them or they're not engaged in them. But I, you know, that's that's that, right? And and all I can do is create openings. I'm not going to like try to force them into learning. And and they like the way I lecture, and and you know, they show up to my classes, so that's good. And I get more more requests to teach than I can actually fill uh, from local institutions. So that's good. Um, I don't like the how you know sort of uh, rigid without thinking, without understanding that they're, they're rigid. So many of my colleagues and the administrators are about, you know, teaching and, and classes. So, you know, for example, um, 
you know, I, I've, I'm, I'm designing a class that's going to be taught in the summer. And I've, I've got these people saying video shouldn't be any longer than 10 minutes. And I'm like, you know, the research doesn't bear that out. Um, and, and people sometimes watch videos that I produce for an hour. Um, they're effective teaching tools, but they've got it. They learned from some pedagogy person that this is what you do. And, and they're almost like, you know, it, it's interesting because academics portray themselves as being like totally open-minded, totally, you know, look at the evidence and stuff like that. Most of them are not that at all. Uh, most of them have their little, little thing that they do and, th and that's it. Um, now I, I have some, you know, I'm fortunate in that I have some, some quite a, every place that I've taught, I've had some good colleagues who I really like and can connect with and we can have some great conversations and, but man, so many of them are like kind of time servers. Uh, or, or, you know, they, they, they understand their little thing and that's about it and everything else is crap of, according to them. So that, those are some of my complaints. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see here. <laughs> so Brian has a, uh, crazy question. Would you kill a hooker for a billion dollars if you were guaranteed to get away with it? No, I, I wouldn't. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's a hooker or somebody else. Um, I wouldn't kill somebody for, for money. Uh, let's see. Oh, well, let me end on this one. Still good. Any recommendations for someone who really enjoyed Rainer Maria Rilke's letters to a young poet? Um, yeah. Yeah. So if you liked his letters to a young poet, you probably would like to read some of his other letters and you can find his other letters and you will find, you know, understandably enough, him treating similar themes like solitude, you know, Einsamkeit in these other letters to other people from uh, over the course of his lifetime. Um, you should also, you know, read his poems. If you haven't read his poems, um, read some of them. And, and I, I wouldn't say start with the later stuff. I would say start with the Book of Hours. Um, those are some really beautiful poems. Um, and they will they will stick with you. And if you can read them in the German, read them in the German and, and read them aloud to yourself. Um, if you can't, then get multiple translations so you can see what, what he's, he's driving at. Um, and then, you know, at some point in time, you do want to read his uh, Duino elegies. Those are some really, you know, wonderful metaphysical stuff to, to check out there. Um, but I would start with, you know, reading around in his other letters. Um, that would probably be quite enjoyable for you. You, you, you would you'd find some really interesting bits of, of things there. And then you can start putting together a more complex picture of who this guy is and what he's thinking about and how he connects poetry and philosophy. The other thing I'll mention too is um, I've never actually heard this stuff, but apparently Gabriel Marcel, the French existentialist thinker, he took some of Rilke's poetry and set it to music. I would love to find out more about that myself. And, and you know, maybe, maybe you'll find out about that. So, all right, I didn't get to everybody's questions, um, but that's kind of unavoidable because the longer that I stay on here, the more questions there are. Um, I wonder if I did like a marathon session, if that would ever come to an end. Um, so that is uh, what I'm going to end on. Uh, I have another thing coming up tomorrow. I'm going to do that in this same format with uh, a, uh, you know, live streaming. Um, we passed the 500, no, we reached the 500 video mark. Passing would be 501. I reached the 500 video mark in the core concepts video series la earlier this week. And so we're going to have a little bit of a celebration. I'm going to talk about the series and why I got started with it and, and, you know, what I've learned along the way and, and who I'm going to do next in the series. Um, so if you want to join me tomorrow, uh, four o'clock central time, um, I'll be here for that. And uh, we'll have, you know, of course, our philosophy pop-ups later in the month as well and other online events. You can find them easily on my Reason I.O. calendar or, um, you know, Patreon supporters, you already know what the online events are. So 
Um, I'm going to say sign off now and, and hope all of you have a great afternoon if you're in this area, morning, evening, whatever it is that you're doing.